climate is in crisis. The signs are all around us. The stakes are high. A healthy future hangs in the balance. Join us for a journey around the globe as we examine how we all are being affected by the growing climate health crisis and what businesses, leaders, artists, and everyday people are doing to solve it. This is 24 Hours of Reality. Protect our planet, protect ourselves. And welcome, I'm Josh Elliott, and we thank you for joining us for 24 hours of reality. Protect our planet, protect ourselves. Now, we know the truth. The climate is in crisis, and our health is at stake. And we're standing here at the most crucial moment in our shared time. Fossil fuel dependency is creating dire pollution-related health consequences the world over. Extreme weather infectious disease, water and food scarcity, all are taking tremendous tolls on the health of individuals, communities, and entire economies. And while the situation is indeed urgent, there are solutions that we can embrace and embrace today. Renewable energy, sustainable agriculture and forestry, low carbon transit, and energy efficient buildings to name but a few. And so for the next 22 hours, we'll be exploring the powerful ways people are coming together to create and affect real change, from using clean energy to fight life-threatening blackouts in Australia, to creating solar-powered hospitals in Nigeria. So travel with us tonight as former Vice President of the United States and the founder and chairman of the Climate Reality Project, Al Gore, leads the way around the globe. And this year, we are pleased to come to you live from the Los Angeles State Historic Park. It sprung from the ground that Angelinos such as myself consider the birthplace of this great city of Los Angeles. In addition to being a truly beautiful setting along the Los Angeles River Greenway, the site also marks a powerful community and environmental triumph, bringing the California State Park's mission to some of the most underserved communities in this the nation's second largest city. And from this home base, Vice President Gore will join us to speak with world leaders. He'll be joined by passionate celebrities and newsmakers such as Claire Danes, Mandy Patinkin, and Brian Cranston. And we'll also enjoy some incredible musical performances as we have tonight from the likes of the Lumineers, We Three, and in this hour, Naya Grace, who will perform live right here on our Los Angeles stage. To see the full rundown of guests, visit 24hoursofreality.org. That's 24hoursofreality.org. And now, for the next hour, we continue our journey in Australia. So please join me in welcoming the man whose leadership and dedication to educating others continues to inspire climate action around the globe. The founder and chairman of the Climate Reality Project and someone I have the distinct honor of sharing this stage tonight, former U.S. Vice President. Al Gore. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Thank you so much for helping us out this year. It really means the world. Thank you. Thank you. So, hour three, we go to, to uh, Australia. Uh, and <laughs> let me start off by congratulating the young people in Australia who just last week, 10,000 students ages 5 through 14 walked out of their elementary school classmates, uh, classrooms for on for, for climate action. Two 14-year-old girls from the state of Victoria organized this, and I, I just want to say, way to go. This is fantastic. So let's take a look at what's going on in Australia and focus on the health impacts of the climate crisis. As in other locations, it has many dimensions, and we're not going to look at every single one of them, but we're going to focus on these six. And I want to start with Heat stress, because as uh, in many other countries, that is uh, the number one killer. And in fact, uh, in the last, this earlier this year, an all time record uh, temperature 47.3 degrees uh, um, uh, Celsius. And uh, it, 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 it really uh, had a, a huge uh, impact. I'm losing the uh, slideshow here. So. Uh, I don't know what's going on, but uh, I'm going to tell you about the health impacts in Australia. In addition to heat stress, we have also seen 
uh, an extreme number of these climate-related extreme events. And they're driven by the heat. And you can see back now, we've got uh, the slides back, 117 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, by the way, uh, in Sydney earlier uh, this year. Uh, and uh, the slides are not <laughs> advancing. So I'm not sure what's going on here. Uh, but in any case, OK, well, we're going we're, we're gonna to extemporize here. We have seen Australia as a kind of ground zero for some of the health impacts of the climate crisis. We have seen uh, these extreme climate events, the, the cyclones, which are the same thing as uh, hurricanes in North America and typhoons uh, in Asia. We have seen them having a, a very harsh impact. We have also seen droughts. In fact, in New South Wales, we have had the worst drought on record during the winter months last year. We're coming up uh, uh, at the beginning of winter in the Southern Hemisphere right now. And the likelihood for extremely high temperatures is above 80% in the vast majority uh, of Australia. Uh, and we're also seeing uh, the flooding events that come with the disruption of the water cycle, which leads to these uh, incredible rain bombs. And uh, we, we've seen that uh, pattern uh, all over uh, Australia, as we have seen it in the rest of the world. Uh, and uh, let's see, let me come back to the slides now. Melbourne uh, had the longest November heat wave in 150 years, uh, basically since records have been kept. The most vulnerable are, are the most harshly impacted. Uh, and, and as I was mentioning, we have uh, an 80% chance of maximum temperatures and temperature records uh, in virtually all of Australia as their summer begins. Uh, I mentioned the extreme weather events. Here's one example, Cyclone Debbie. Uh, here's a dramatic video from Hobart, Australia. And by the way, these two guys are in a hotel watching the floodwaters come down the hallway toward their room. It kind of brings the impacts home. Uh, earlier this year in Queensland, 409 millimeters of rain in 24 hours. That's 16 inches of rain uh, in 24 hours. Uh, we, we've seen the same pattern with these rain bombs and then long periods without rain. That's what we're seeing uh, all over the world. I mentioned the New South Wales uh, drought. We've also had fire risk. Uh, this is earlier this year uh, in New South Wales. And just uh, last week, there were a whole uh, bunch of fires uh, in New South Wales. In parts of Queensland, the uh, fire danger rating reached catastrophic levels for the first time just uh, last week. This is a, a fire last week in deep water in Queensland. By the way, we're going to be having a training in Queensland in less, uh, in less than a year in, in Brisbane. We'll talk about that more later. Sea level rise. Already storm surges are damaging homes on the seaside uh, in Sydney. Infectious diseases, we've talked about this in the rest of the world. Uh, the climate crisis is, is making life better for the spread of infectious diseases. And we've seen, as always, airline travel has a role to play. But there are some unique uh, threats uh, in Australia, uh, such as the Ross River virus, along with yellow fever and dengue and malaria, chikungunya. Uh, and they're expanding in Australia. And what we're seeing is that malaria and dengue are expected to be endemic in southern uh, Queensland by mid-century, not that uh, long from now. Tick-borne diseases, the uh, ge geographic range for the species of ticks in Australia uh, is expanding. Allergens, uh, anybody that has hay fever or uh, asthma or allergies, uh, unfortunately has uh, to anticipate a huge increase in the pollutants in the air and the pollen that causes these diseases. Air pollution, as with elsewhere, the burning of fossil fuels that creates global warming uh, uh, pollution also creates the kind of air pollution that causes lung diseases, contributes already to 3,000 deaths per year in Australia and takes more than $2.5 billion annually off the economy. And by the way, about one in 10 Australians have asthma today. Nine million asthma emergency room visits uh, each year because of air pollution. 
Now, uh, freshwater scarcity. This is uh, a particular problem in Australia, and some of the waterborne diseases are a greater threat, uh, partly because uh, increased coastal flooding in Australia is expected uh, to spread cholera and vibrio and other waterborne uh, diseases. So uh, the good news is that we do have the solutions at hand. And, uh, you know, Australia is a big uh, coal producing nation, but it's also a nation blessed, as few others are, with great sun re resources and wind resources. Wind is expanding rapidly in Australia. Here is a depiction of where the large wind farms have already been built. In Australia, uh, a lot of facilities, they're really making life better. Solar is expanding even more rapidly. We're seeing a dramatic increase because solar electricity is now cheaper than electricity from new coal or natural gas plants. And it's already uh, cheaper to get electricity from wind and solar uh, than it is from fossil fuels. A new solar PV rooftop system is installed in Australia every three minutes on average. And the progress has now reached the stage where one in five houses have rooftop solar. Australia, South Australia just installed the largest battery in the world to help uh, make solar energy even cheaper and better. And that's going to fuel a lot more growth for solar energy. So we have a health crisis connected to the climate crisis, but we have the solutions. They're beginning to be implemented. Now we need the policy to speed that up. And that's where you come in. Like those school children who are leading the way, a little child shall lead them, as my faith tradition teaches. You can lead this change. We need to implement it more quickly. And you can lead by starting uh, with climate solutions uh, of which you are a part. It's why we want to hear your voice. So every hour we are going to be checking in to see what you're doing and what you're talking about and how you're taking action and what your questions are on social media with actor and climate activist Kalem Worthy. Although at the top of this hour, Kalem, I see you have a very special guest. I have a very special guest. I've been a big fan of her for a very long time. Aww. Allison Stoner. Hi, how's Th it going? I'm doing fantastic now that you're here. Oh, I'm so honored to be here. Thanks for having me. So now you are a very active environmentalist. You're yes. fighting the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. What got you involved in the first place? Well, you know, I recently actually just returned from my first ever Arctic expedition with environmentalists, um, scientists, experts across several sectors, and we were able to witness climate change firsthand. We were retrieving plastics that had floated all the way um, to the Arctic. We were seeing the melting glaciers, and and I'd already started changing my diet and my lifestyle years prior, but to see it firsthand made it so vivid. And now as a storyteller, my hope is to be able to communicate that to my audience, to people who love entertainment, but need to know what's really going on. Well, we are very <laughs> excited to have you here doing you. just that. Now, we have asked people to use the hashtag 24 hours of reality on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And we have some amazing posts I want to show you. Yes. Uh, we have a watch party happening in Portland, Oregon. Wow. And it's actually one of the climate reality chapters there. Now, the food looks really good. <laughs> um, can you package it up and overnight it to us? You have about 22 hours to get it to us. If you can, <laughs> oh I would be very grateful. We also have a watch party uh, over in uh, Tacoma as wow, well. Wow, an entire movie theater. There's a whole movie theater. They rented out a theater to watch this show. So thank you so much. Yes. Now, you can have your post up here as well. If you use the hashtag 24 hours of reality, if you're having a watch party, we want to focus on you at the next time we come here to the social media corner. Use the hashtag 24 hours of reality, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and you could be right up here. And again, we want to hear from you, so please uh, join us. Now, during this broadcast, we are going to be looking at several broad areas where the climate crisis and our dependency on fossil fuels specifically are now creating dire health consequences, areas that include intensifying extreme weather, worsening pollution, the spread of infectious disease, and increasing food and water insecurity. And the outlook grows darker when you consider that such massive problems are in fact interconnected, creating rippling effects that go far beyond any one health impact as seen in the mental health challenges posed by exposure to prolonged stress or the declining climate conditions leading to conflict and violence and population displacement. We then right now wanna take a closer look at one such area, the real impact of food and water insecurity. Here's Mandy Patinkin. 
Our climate is in crisis. Our health is at stake. We think of climate crisis as something we can't really see. But look around. It's already affecting our food and water. Extreme weather is wilting farms and changing how crops grow. Groundwater supplies are drying up in some parts of the world. Elsewhere, thawing glaciers that provide water for billions are slowly disappearing. Erratic rains, increasing drought, and skyrocketing temperatures are all contributing to a world with less clean water and healthy food to go around, threatening the well-being of people and communities around the world. When it comes to our food and water, the climate health connection works like this. Burning fossil fuels fill the atmosphere with carbon pollution, raising temperatures worldwide. That means less snow piling up in winter. Snow that used to feed rivers and reservoirs come spring. It means longer droughts and less water seeping down into the earth and restoring critical groundwater supplies. And it means glaciers that store water as ice are melting at unprecedented rates. It all adds up, less water for the farms and streams that feed us, less water for us to live. In these conditions, yields of crops like rice, corn, and wheat, staples that feed the world are threatened. It's a danger that expands right as the world's population is too. As hotter becomes the new normal, large parts of the world are at risk of losing the crops that have supported them for generations. Imagine Bordeaux without wine, Brazil without coffee, a world where chocolate becomes scarce as the Ivory Coast, Ghana, and Indonesia get too warm to produce cacao. It's more than heat. The climate crisis is throwing seasons out of balance and fueling all kinds of extreme weather, threatening global food supplies. Devastating storms and floods strike harder and more often, sometimes wiping out entire harvests. Rain and frost increasingly come out of season and destroy crops. And pests and diseases are spreading further across our planet, reaching regions once too cold to support them. Crop blights like wheat rust and molds that can make us sick and stunt children's growth are slowly expanding their reach too. Plus, scientists are beginning to understand a new threat. Elevated levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are depleting protein and key nutrients like iron and zinc in crops. The food we've eaten for centuries is slowly becoming less nutritious, putting countless people at risk of malnutrition. Bottom line. It's a direct connection from burning fossil fuels to a world where nutritious food and clean water become scarce. But today, we can skip the dirty stuff and protect our health and power our lives with clean and affordable renewable energy. In a world where our health is in the balance, the choice is clear. Protect our planet, protect ourselves. Find out more at climaterealityproject.org. And we do thank Mandy Patinkin for that. Our next guest, meanwhile, went through one of the very earliest climate reality leader trainings in Australia back in 2007. Dr. Stephen Miles is the Minister for Health and the Minister for Ambulance Services in Queensland, and he is good enough to join us now via satellite in Brisbane. And Minister Miles, it is great to welcome you back to the show. Always great to have you. And for people who might not know, in fact, you've been a part of climate reality now for over a decade, 11 years now. And is it fair to say, given that, that the work you've done with climate reality has actually influenced the work you've done there in Australia? Oh, good day, Josh. It's fantastic to be with you again. Uh, it's certainly true that uh, I've been part of the Climate Reality Project now for 11 years. I signed up when my wife was pregnant with our first son, Sam, and he's 11 now, old enough to join the campaign himself, I guess. And throughout that whole time, uh, it, it's really been a common thread in, in my political activism, uh, trying to make sure that we do as a state and as a country what we need to, to do to address climate change. And I guess uh, we've got two more kids now, but I'm still doing it for them, those, those three little kids. Now, just a couple of minutes ago, we heard the vice president detail uh, the uh, 
innumerable uh, challenges faced there in Australia. But now as the Minister of Health, what are the health impacts now that you are seeing due to climate crisis in Queensland? Well, it's already a, a, a pretty hot country, Australia, and when you make the planet hotter, uh, that that flows through here. We're just in Queensland coming to the end of a, a record heat wave, a record November heat wave, and the biggest impact is uh, in terms of the, the, the immediate heat stress that affects the elderly and children in particular, and many of them have found themselves uh, in our hospitals this last uh, week or uh, this last week or two. The, the heat, though, has also led to an extraordinary number of bushfires. At one stage, we were fighting more than 160 bushfires, and they bring with them uh, smoke, of course, uh, asthma, other respiratory diseases that are, that are also affecting Queenslanders. And of course, it also then impacts the financial bottom line. What sort of impact are you seeing as it regards health care costs there? Well, obviously, our first concern is for the health of Queenslanders, but uh, these events uh, are also putting extraordinary pressure on our health system. The, uh, over the last week, uh, the uh, demand for ambulance services has literally been off the charts. They've had to change the scale of the graph they use uh, to, to, uh, to show me the number of ambulance call-outs each day. And, of course, those kinds of health services are very expensing, expensive, and we're needing uh, many more of them as, as it heats up. Then let's uh, turn the glass half full, uh, if but for a moment. What then can you do? What is being done to combat this? Well, look, our focus uh, very much has been on transferring our economy to renewables, and we've been uh, really successful at that at, in, in, in recent years. We've set our goal of 50% renewables by 2030, and we're uh, on track to get there, and that's really the best way to change our entire economy is to, to change the kind of fuel we're using. And to that point, Australia, again, is the largest exporter of coal in the world. Obviously, it's been historically vital to the Australian economy. But given that then, how do you uh, influence, if nothing else, the political attitudes on matters related to the climate crisis in particular when uh, those things seem to run uh, at such loggerheads into each other? Well, look, it's true that much of the prosperity we enjoy now has been built off the back of those uh, cheap fossil fuels, and that's also meant that when campaigning for climate action, we've come against uh, some very well-resourced vested interests. But uh, I believe, and I know, that our state is also uh, the source of uh, some of the best, most plentiful, cheapest renewable energy, particularly solar, uh, but also wind and, and others, and that can really drive that, that next wave of prosperity uh, 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 through our state, and, and we're already seeing that change happening. Given the fact, though, that the Prime Minister there in Australia is such an ardent supporter of coal, of fossil fuels, for you personally, how difficult is it then to manage that politically, uh, again, when your PM uh, holds such a view at such the opposite end of a spectrum? Well, it has been pretty hard to see our Prime Minister embrace uh, coal uh, the, the way that he has um, uh, really aggressively. But I guess, I guess the great thing about Australia is our Prime Ministers don't last too long. And I'm pretty <laughs> sure we're going to have one pretty soon who will be much more committed to renewables, much more committed to working with us to deliver that transition. And I'm really looking forward to that. Well, there's so much more uh, that is great about uh, Australia and uh, Dr. Stephen Miles again. We appreciate your participation for an 11th year. We are holding you to your 12th. We will see you 364 and a half or so days from now. We thank you very much, Dr. Miles. And we wonder for you, are you inspired by what you're learning today? We want you to continue your learning then and advocacy at the upcoming Climate Reality Leadership Corps training in Brisbane. That's on June 5th through June 7th, 2000. And 19. You can join former Vice President Al Gore and a host of inspiring experts, all to gain a deeper understanding of the climate fight we find ourselves in in the Australia and Pacific Islands region 
and the tools and know-how and the networks to make a real difference. So for more information and to apply, we ask you to visit climaterealityproject.org backslash training. Again, climaterealityproject.org backslash training. And now here with an exclusive performance for 24 hours of reality, hailing all the way from Monmouth, Oregon, Nia Grace with her hit song, Blue. Well, we know the climate crisis and our dependency on fossil fuels has created a very real threat to public health. But there are individuals, businesses, and entire communities all around the globe who are taking action to solve this crisis and so create a healthier future for all of us. In South Australia, one CEO, Mike Cannon Brooks, in fact sought to end the region's life-threatening blackouts with clean energy. And he succeeded. And it all began with but a single tweet.
power has been cut to all of South Australia as wild storms lash the state. The city was a scene of absolute chaos. With no traffic lights, cars were gridlocked. Ongoing weather chaos has stretched emergency crews to the limit. The weather on the 28th and the scale of impact was unprecedented in South Australia's history. We saw a series of 11 tornadoes in the mid-north of the state and uh, 23 high-voltage power lines were down. That day is always going to stick in my mind because it was our daughter's 16th birthday. I am a wife and mum of three. I'm also a journalist for a national breakfast television program. From a work perspective, it was, it was just chaos. The depth of the impact is difficult to fathom until you've experienced it as a community. So even something as simple as accessing cash from an ATM becomes complex. I was watching the power drain on my phone and thinking I had to report on the blackout the next morning. We're not sure how safe it is to drive on the streets because they're pitch black. All hospitals went on to back up power, but a number of the hospitals had their gen sets uh, fail. There was some um, uh, tragic consequences with the, uh, the loss of some embryos that were in refrigeration, and those human impacts are really significant. We're a first world country. How could it be that an entire state is without power? It was absolutely laughable. My recollection is that there was a lot of finger pointing at the time, in fact, as to who was actually at fault. When the storm came through, it blew over some power lines and it just asked too much of the power system that was set up by the Australian energy market operator. The federal government has blamed renewables. It had nothing to do with renewables at all. It was fundamentally a storm, but um, unfortunately the market operator didn't prepare the power system for a storm event. They just ran it as if it was a sunny Sunday afternoon. It was never going to work. We had another outage in December. That's probably a, a worse time as far as temperature goes because it was hot. Um, so everyone loses their cool. On the 8th of February, we had another blackout. Then the evaluations began to occur. We'd had uh, this period really of 10 years of underinvestment in our electricity market. And so you had about 13 coal-fired power stations close and that was causing increases in price and eventually reductions in reliability in the system. And so the question really became, what was the solution? It was at that point that we then formulated the state energy plan. We were sitting there in March. Something had to be in place by the 1st of December. There was nothing that could quickly fill the void, at least at that time, and that's where the battery actually came in. Whenever there's an upset in the network, you can have a loss of energy, you know, hundreds and hundreds of megawatts come out of the system. That tends to have an effect on frequency. The battery essentially stabilises the network. No one had ever tried to use a battery in this way in any power systems which can switch in and push a lot of capacity onto the system very quickly. So it was novel, it was risky, but we felt confident that uh, a battery would be our answer. Sorry, I'm looking a bit formal today. My name is Mike Kennebrooks. I'm the co-founder and co-CEO of Atlassian. There was an article about Lyndon Rive, who was at the time the head of storage uh, technology for Tesla, and happened to be asked, did he think that they could solve the problem that they'd been having with rolling blackouts at an industrial scale? And he just happened to say, yeah, sure, we could do that. So I was at home late one night and uh, rather frustrated with some things and started sending out tweets. Lyndon and Elon Musk, how serious are you about this bet? If I can make the money happen in the politics, can you guarantee 100 megawatts in 100 days? He replied, Tesla will get the system installed and working in 100 days from contract signature or it is free. Is that serious enough for you? I responded, uh, legend, you're on mate. Give me seven days to try to sort out the politics and the funding. Direct message me a quote for approximately 100 megawatt cost mates rates. And then a few things happened after that. The South Australian government really came to the party. They accelerated a policy paper that they were already working on. When Elon came back with the pricing, he about halved the popular view price on large-scale storage. He made an offer we couldn't refuse. 
the Twitter exchange between Elon Musk and Cannon Brooks was really powerful. You need people with ideas, and so I don't mind the sort of under 40 billionaires coming up with, you know, Twitter bets and things like that. I think it makes it interesting. The terrific climate event that led to the blackout in South Australia forced the South Australian government into building an energy plan. Neuen is a world leader in renewable energy. We develop, build and own assets like wind farms, solar farms and batteries all over the world. We teamed up with Tesla. Without a blackout in South Australia in 2016, probably the government energy plan would have taken a bit longer, but I really think it was uh, the right thing to do. So people would realize that the integration of renewable energy into the grid would work perfectly well with uh, storage. The battery injects a lot of energy in a very short time frame. And it works like a buffer. Say one power station shuts down, it can take that load instantly for a short time until other services can be started up like a sponge. Last year we were involved in the construction of the Tesla battery at Hornsdale. Everyone had a, a common goal to get this thing delivered on time and everyone seemed to take a bit of ownership of getting to that point. It'd be one of the happiest construction sites we've worked on. And the rest is history. They built it within the, the 100 days and by the 1st of December it was uh, in place and ready to roll. For two years since, we haven't had a blackout associated with the intermittency of renewable energy, even though the proportion of renewable energy in our system has actually increased. The battery has saved millions of dollars to the South Australian taxpayer by reducing the cost of frequency control and ancillary services 75% over the last 12 months. To the sceptics, there was a lightning strike that took out a piece of infrastructure in New South Wales. A battery in South Australia kept the lights on in New South Wales. I think it's definitely a step in the right direction. If Australia's ever going to go for green energy, and it's proving itself that it works. Just an impossibly great story. And now let's meet the man who changed the future of energy in Australia. Please welcome the co-founder and co-CEO of Atlassian, Mike Cannon-Brooks, as he joins Vice President Al Gore. Yeah, thank you, Josh. And Mike, thank you for coming here. I know that uh, you've got some business uh, from time to time in California. I'm happy this lined up. And thank you for Thanks coming. Thanks for having me. I'm glad we can make the dates work. I loved watching that video and how you and Elon Musk were going back and forth on Twitter. So uh, I wish more of the world worked that way, where two guys with a lot of moxie and technical chops uh, just start challenging <laughs> each other. Well, uh, it, took, uh, it took the politicians to come to the party. It took people power as well. A, yeah. lot, of, a lot of people you know, really made a big noise about it, and, uh, and I was glad we could get it all to come together. So. Now that was a great achievement, and it was, it's like the biggest battery in the entire world. Yep. Double what the previous record was. Uh, three times. Yeah, three, three times, times bigger the, than at, at the time. Yeah, yeah, and so this may sound a little technical, but could, I, know the, I know part of the answer, but batteries are really solar power extenders and wind power extenders, because mm -hmm. you can use it when the sun's not shining, the wind's not blowing, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would think about storage in general, uh, be it pumped hydro, so putting water uphill into a dam or down, right. uh, or a battery like lithium ion, like in your telephone. Yeah. It lets you time shift the energy. Yeah. So the sun is shining during the day, you can store some of that, and then use that at nighttime when you come home and turn your lights on. Um, so we'll end up with lots of different forms of storage around the grid, Yeah. Um, but this was a pretty big lighthouse project. Yeah, and it's a project that fits into a larger vision that you have of Australia going 100% renewable energy and being an energy ex exporter of renewable energy, sure. right? Yeah. How'd you come up with this idea? Um, well, I mean, Australia is uh, per square meter the sunniest country in the world, uh, and we, have, we are spoilt for resources uh, if you count the sun and the wind and the water as resources, which I think we should. Um, we have enough solar resources to power the world's electricity grids, all of them, five times over, just in Australia alone. Wow. Um, but we need to have a vision to be exporting that energy more than just 100% for ourselves, which I think we should get to, 
it should be an export industry. We have a long, proud history as a, as a resource exporter, uh, mm -hmm. and we need to start seeing the sun and the wind as a resource we can export in lots of different ways. Now, I know you're not in politics, not formally. I don't hear you described no. as a politician. But you got fired up a little bit and in an, uh, an exchange with your current prime minister, uh, mm -hmm. something about fair dinkum. Uh, sure. You know, we, we Americans hear these words like gobsmacked and good on you. And fair dinkum means basically fair and just, right? Yeah, fair, just, uh, honest, truthful. It's a, if you say he's fair dinkum, it means, you know, he's, uh, he's a good bloke. He's very honest and, and trustworthy. But, but your prime minister used that phrase in a way that uh, seemed like he was talking about coal, burning coal for electricity. Sure. That kind of got under your skin a little bit? It did, it did. He used it in, uh, in the sense with the quote that, you know, you need fit income, reliable power when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow. Uh, and uh, we have a huge problem with fossil fuel uh, uh, and the government in Australia uh, yeah. combining in various nefarious ways. And so what we set out to do is create a movement to reclaim the term fed income to what most Australians <laughs> would think is fed income, which is uh, clean energy, it is cheap energy, and it is an economic opportunity for the country. So we're yeah. trying to tell a really positive story about renewables, yeah. um, that we can build a huge industry in our country exporting renewables to the world, and we should be leaning into that uh, for job creation and for, for the economic growth. And you think it really can be done? Absolutely. Yeah, we have a number of lighthouse projects going on at the moment to either send it, for example, across a wire, ultra high voltage DC wire from the northwest uh, of Australia to Indonesia, um, so we can capture the sun and send it across on a wire. And we have other projects that are taking um, very cheap energy from sun and wind and separating water into hydrogen and oxygen, right. letting the oxygen go into the atmosphere, which is good, capturing the hydrogen, and then we can put that on a tanker and, and ship that in various forms. So there's a lot of ways we can use that energy to export it. So how'd you end up with the Prime Minister? Uh, are you best buddies now? What, what, uh, uh... I don't think I'm on his Christmas card list this year. Uh, <laughs> he'll, probably, he'll probably send me a lump of coal, so we'll see uh, how that goes. Yeah. Well, you got some elections coming up we uh, do. next yeah, May do. or something like that. Uh, March in New South Wales, yeah. uh, which doesn't have a renewable energy target and right. should. It's right. one of the last states to hold out, so we we got to get that done in March. Yeah. And then in uh, probably in May for the for the federal federal election. Where, and, to um, see who's going to be prime minister uh, next time. That's right, and uh, climate's one of the big two issues for that, and uh, yeah. we hope to continue to keep it on the agenda and get some real change. Well, uh, what about the news media in Australia? Uh, how, how's that going? Like with, you know, uh, the Great Barrier Reef, for example, is one of the greatest treasures of the entire world, and it's under severe threat. It's terrible, from, terrible story from the, the climate yeah. crisis. Yeah, and is that covered in the news media? Um, not enough. Not enough. We have uh, certain parts of the news media that are very one-sided when it comes to the debate. Um, so we need to do everything we can to get the story out there about what's going on. It's ironic that. Uh, in Queensland especially, you have such a massive natural resource, which is a source of tourism, a source of, you know, huge dollars yeah. for the state, uh, and is, is being destroyed by climate change as we, uh, as we go on on a constant basis. And uh, it is not reported anywhere nearly enough. Uh, yeah, the people are trying you to do, do have some great news media outlets in Australia. I, I know that, but I know that some of the some of the media has been kind of the sure. way some of the media and that's what i mean i mean you saw you talked earlier about the fifteen thousand kids on last friday yeah literally um, parading down the streets and and trying to really retake that um that catalyzed i think just the anger of the of the next generation yeah. about how little is being done politically on this issue um and so you know we've been big supporters of them and uh they're not going to stop they're they're going to yeah. keep going so they're pretty determined the rising generation is demanding a better world it and is you referred to queensland we had an interview uh, earlier uh with one of the ministers from uh queensland and i'm going to have an interview uh in, in a minute uh you're from sydney though yep. right yep what a beautiful city it is a beautiful city it's fantastic well, in Queensland next June, we're going to have a climate reality training for three days mm -hmm. in Brisbane, and we're inviting uh, people from the Pacific Island nations to also come and attend. And I look forward to seeing you back in Australia. And in closing, let me just say, I like your style. I love your passion. I really appreciate your commitment. I love the way you get things done. Thank you for joining us on 24 Hours. Oh, thank you for having me.
That makes two of us, to be sure. Now, each year, 24 Hours of Reality brings the world together for one full day to discuss the reality of the climate crisis and how we might go about solving it. So today, you can become a citizen producer of this live broadcast and have your name appear in the closing credits. So don't miss your chance to support this world-changing event. Visit 24HoursOfReality.org to learn how. Again, 24HoursOfReality.org to learn how. Or if you're watching us on Facebook, use the hashtag IFightForClimate to get started. All right, we want to check back in now with Caleb Worthy and his very special guest to see what's being said on social media. Welcome back to Social Media Corner. I'm Caleb Worthy. I'm Allison Stoner. And we are so excited because we're getting so many amazing tweets, posts, Facebook posts. It is unbelievable. From everywhere. From everywhere. This whole map is just lighting up like yes. a Christmas tree. It is fantastic. Now, I want to show you some of the posts that we have that we really, really loved. We got one here from Canada, my home country. And look at all these young activists who are clearly great environmentalists doing their bit, and they're standing together watching this. It's fantastic. Where else? Where else? Where else? Okay, cool. Looks like there's a watch party with the LA Climate Reality Chapter. By the way, I'm getting ready to start my training soon. No way. Yes, so thank you for what you do. It's really incredible. I've learned so much already tonight. If you want to go to the trainings, go to climaterealityorg and you can become a climate leader yourself. I've done the training as well. It is unbelievable. We also have a post from Soka University oh, here awesome. in California. Now, you guys look like you're ready to be here all night. <laughs> yes. I have a pretty good feeling. We're going to be here all night as well. Stay awake. We're not going to sleep. <laughs> We're not going to eat. We're going to stand right here to check out your social media posts. So I hope you guys do as well. If you guys do, send us another post, maybe like 12, 13, 14 yeah, hours. Yeah, and if you ever get tired, just get up and dance. It's a trick I use all the time. That is a great idea. Oh, awesome. OK, Denver, I hope my sister is there. Hi, sister. Hello. Are you hanging out? This is nice. I love seeing people just taking initiative, creating their own momentum. Sometimes you feel like you're the only person in your community, so it's nice when you're able to find like-minded people and spread the word, get people involved. And this is incredible just to see all of the different places in the world that people are watching right now. Absolutely. And this also, when we talk about watch parties, this is an actual watch party. Yes. I think they rented out a pub for this <laughs> event. They're definitely dancing. <laughs> So now uh, we have some more people who are checking out uh, some watch parties at some universities as well. Thank you guys so much. And yes. if you want to be up on this board for millions of people all around the world to see, <laughs> use the hashtag 24 hours of reality on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, mm -hmm. and you could be on this board as well. All right. Thank you so much. On to you, Josh. All right, and again, it all starts with you, so keep your messages coming. Meanwhile, our next guest here is the Minister for Environment and the Great Barrier Reef, as well as Minister for Science and Minister for the Arts in Queensland. Please welcome Minister Leanne Enoch, who is joining us remotely from Brisbane for a live conversation with Vice President Al Gore. Hi, Minister Enoch. Thank you so much for joining us. I, I re I'm really grateful. It was good to see you recently. And I was listening to your portfolio of responsibilities. I read it before. That's quite a uh, quite a, a lot of challenges you have in front of you. Let's zero in on uh, climate and renewable energy and tell us a little bit about what your plans are for Queensland. Uh, well, of course, in terms of being able to deal with the issues of climate change, one of the key things that our government in Queensland did in this term of government uh, was to ensure that we t uh, uh, ended broad-scale tree clearing in this state. Uh, we saw more than 400,000 hectares being cleared in one year and we had to make a, we had to put the stop to that. Uh, that was unsustainable and so we have uh, passed legislation to ensure that that's no longer happening in our state. On top of that we have set some pretty robust targets uh, for our state including 50% renewables by 2030 and of course zero net emissions by 2050. Uh, all of these uh, bodies of work under our targets uh, are absolutely working hard to ensure that uh, this state meets our commitments. Well, that's a very impressive uh, agenda and 50% renewables by 2030, that's uh, a huge challenge. But in Queensland, I understand you already have a huge pickup uh, for the technology of solar rooftop panels. 
it's something, how many uh, homes are ready or what percentage of the homes? It's really quite impressive. It is quite impressive. It's a, it's a huge percentage of Queensland homes that are already taking up uh, the challenge of ensuring that we're uh, bringing in renewables to our everyday streets and everyday homes. Uh, but of course there's more work to be done. Uh, we're, on t we're on track in terms of our uh, targets with regards to 50% renewables by 2030. Uh, we hope that by the end of next year some of our tracking is telling us that uh, we'll be at around the 20%. Uh, we're already seeing some uh, more than $3 billion worth of investment uh, in the renewable industry in Queensland, which is a huge indication uh, that this is where the money is moving. Uh, and of course, this is where the future is, not just for Queensland, but for our country in Australia. Now, you're also Minister for the Great Barrier Reef, and uh, those of us around the world who have learned about the Great Barrier Reef, you know, it's just stunning. Uh, it's one of the great treasures of the world. And for Queensland, it's also a source of a tremendous amount of tourist dollars. But uh, you have expressed great urgency about protecting the health of the Great Barrier Reef. And why the urgency? Tell us. Well, um, you're absolutely right in terms of um, its importance to not just our economy. I mean, it, it uh, provides about $6 billion to the Australian economy. Um, it provides jobs to more than 60,000 people uh, in Queensland. So it's incredibly important to our economy, but it's incredibly important to our environment and our ecology. Uh, it is absolutely urgent uh, that we move to support the health of the Great Barrier Reef because it is literally uh, the window, the yardstick, if you like, uh, to the health of our broader ecology and uh, environment. Uh, we are uh, working very hard in this space. We've committed some $330 million uh, over five years to support and protect the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, much of that work has been happening around water quality. Uh, so some $261 million supporting uh, projects to ensure that uh, water that is running into the Great Barrier Reef through the various catchments uh, is of a quality that assists the Great Barrier Reef to be able to uh, withstand some of the changes and challenges that it's facing. Uh, we know that uh, increasing temperatures of the water of the oceans is a huge, uh, huge issue for not just the Great Barrier Reef, uh, which of course is the largest uh, reef of its kind in the world, but obviously for reef systems right across the right across the world. Uh, so that's why it is absolutely urgent uh, that we act now, uh, not just as a state or a country, but as a globe. Yeah, it's certainly true. And in addition to the rising temperature of the ocean waters, there's also the acidification of the oceans with the extra CO2 absorbed by the oceans making it more difficult for the coral polyps to make the, the bones of the coral. But I wanted to shift gears and ask you, I talked with our last uh, guest, Mike Cannonbrooks, about uh, the government in Australia, and now I'm referring to the federal government. Uh, the views that I've heard about climate and even the Great Barrier Reef are a little bit different. Uh, can you shed some light on that? Yeah, it's in, it's, it is incredibly disappointing that at a federal level currently in Australia uh, that we don't have a government that is willing to uh, take some leadership around uh, climate, um, climate action uh, and climate change policy. Uh, there is still an absolutely, sadly, some climate change deniers at our federal level. Uh, and of course that leaves us at a sub-national level to take up the challenge and take up the leadership. Uh, this is not unusual unfortunately. We're seeing this in other parts of the world where uh, federally the leadership is uh, stepping away from uh, some of the very tough things that we have to do and sub-nationals are having to fill the vacuum in terms of leadership. Uh, we're doing that in Queensland in terms of setting some very bold targets in terms of investing uh, financially uh, to shift and transition our economy uh, and also to protect the assets that we currently have. But without a federal government that actually takes climate change seriously, that believes in it, that accepts the science in it, uh, we continue to have uh, massive challenges in terms of lining up policy. Yeah, well said. Um, and now I want to ask you about the Adani coal mine. And I know it's controversial in Australia. I, you know, it doesn't create 
jobs as far as I can tell, and it adds to the pollution of the air and global warming. But last week, Adani announced that it would self-finance the development of a smaller Carmichael coal project. Does that mean that that mine is, will now be going forward? Uh, well, we've always said at a state level uh, in Queensland uh, that any project, including the Adani project, uh, must stack up itself financially, stand on its own two feet financially, but it must stack up environmentally. Uh, so, you know, there is still more work to be done around all of that. There are some outstanding matters and much of that is with the federal government currently uh, to make some decisions around. But, you know, this is in... Uh, this is all happening at a time when we're seeing right across the world uh, a trans transitioning economies around thermal coal use in particular. Uh, and that's why, as a government in Queensland, we have invested so much uh, in the renewables efforts that we have here in Queensland. Uh, like I said, 50% renewables by 2030, more than uh, $3 billion already invested in this space. So we know that, uh, you know, smart investors are investing in renewables. Uh, and that's where the growth is, that's where the opportunity is uh, for countries to flourish, uh, for our state to flourish. Uh, and we're continuing our work in that space. Well, that all strikes me as a a common sense approach and I congratulate you on your skill as an advocate and the depth uh, with which you've uh, dug into these issues. I'm looking forward to being in Queensland six months from now for a three-day uh, climate reality training in Brisbane. Enjoyed meeting you recently. Look forward to being with you in Brisbane. Uh, but for now, thank you so much for being a part of 24 Hours of Reality and keep up your great work. Well, over the last hour, we have spent uh, some time getting to know just some of the health challenges faced by the people in Australia. We've explored the many ways people there are taking action to solve the climate crisis and create a healthier and more sustainable future for themselves and thus for us all. Remember, you are the most powerful advocate for your health. So please go to 24hoursofreality.org. That's 24hoursofreality.org where you can share the news and insist upon urgent action now. Or if you are in the United States, you can text CLIMATE to 40649 to get started. Again, text CLIMATE to 40649 to get started. Because when we protect our planet, we protect ourselves. Hey, my name is Courtney Barnett, and I am excited to be part of this year's 24 Hours of Reality. Oh! 